All right. Um, I know others are going to join. That's fine. But um, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Brett Schonsenbach, President and CEO of the Carlsbad Chamber of Commerce, and I am turning this meeting over to Teresa Acosta, our co-chair of the committee. Great. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I know that people will continue to join us as the, the morning wears on. We're at exactly 731 now, so I'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. On behalf of the Carlsbad Chamber of Commerce, thank you so much for being here for our Government Affairs Committee meeting. Uh, as usual, we begin with a pledge of allegiance, so I'll pass it over to our board member representative, Catherine Magania, to lead us. Great. Uh, good morning, everybody. So if you would please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. We have my little flag with us today. So ready to begin. <laughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, which is now one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. That's always fun to do on Zoom, right? <laughs> I, uh, I'm so happy to be here with you today. We've got some excellent <coughs> speakers. We have two amazing speakers on the agenda. I'm sure you've seen them. And uh, we'll, we'll begin so that our speakers and we all know who is in the room by having the virtual room by having a round of introduction. And it looks like we have a small enough audience where people can do self introductions so far. When other people uh, come in, uh, they're not going to have this opportunity. So uh, jump in now. Uh, I'll begin and we'll, we'll do a, a little chain of introductions if that's all right with you. I'll show you my 17 second introduction and then pass it along to the next person. I'll also help facilitate the introductions, but if you could call on the next person when you're done with your introduction, that would help us move quickly so that we can get to our presentations faster. Okay, so I'll, I'll begin. Hi, I'm Teresa Acosta. I am the president of Acosta and Partners Consulting Company. We build public private partnerships for communities all over California, specializing in working with technology companies. Teresa Acosta, Acosta and Partners, and I am chairing this committee. I will move it along to uh, Rosemary Eshelman. Good morning, I'm Rosemary Eshelman. I work for Carlsbad Unified School District. I work student services for Carlsbad Unified School District, and I'll move it along to Tom Robertson. Hi, Tom Robertson. I'm uh, representing Terry Woods for the North County Daily Star online newspaper. And let's go with Philip, Abrina. Good morning, everyone. Phil Urbina, Opus Productivity Solutions. We use online behavioral assessments to help companies hire the right people for the right job and manage them as well. Phil Urbina. And I'll go to Jim Scanlon. Hi, my name is Jim Scanlon. I'm the broker at Scanlon Realty Management, the village of Carlsbad. And I'll hand this over to Ben Haddad. Ben? Hey, Jim. Uh, ben Haddad with California Strategies, government relations firm. We're looking forward to January 2021. And I will turn it over to Amber. Good morning, everyone. Amber Turvroot with Scripps Health. Uh, we are a nonprofit healthcare delivery system in <laughs> And I will hand it over to Risa. <laughs> Risa? Hi everybody. Hi everybody, sorry, having technical difficulties. My name is Risa Barron. I'm with the San Diego County Water Authority. It's a pleasure to be here today and thank you for the opportunity to let us present later. Thank you. And I will, uh, I will uh, 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 Wade, could you please introduce yourself? Thanks, Risa. Uh, Wade Ashbrenner. I'm with Audeo 2 Charter School. We serve students in grades 6 through 12 here in Carlsbad. And I will throw it over to Crystal. Good morning, everyone. Crystal Jabbar with the Office of Supervisor Jim Desmond. Um, hope everyone is doing well. And I will hand it off to Sue Lofton. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Sue Lofton, Lofton Bedell. We're a law firm, real estate and business. Uh, and I will turn it over to, I'm going to see who hasn't talked, uh, Judy Reese. 
Oh, hi. I'm Judy Reese, a resident of uh, Carlsbad for 33 years now, and I'm uh, working with a voter registration team in San Diego County and really interested in uh, voting, uh, voter registration, and what Michael Blue has to say. I'll hand it to Alex. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Um, my name is Alex Kiwan, and I'm a field representative with State Assembly member Tasha Burner Horvath's office. Um, I am going to hand it off to Kyle. Good morning, everyone. Kyle Crail Flander with Congressman Mike Levin, and I will hand it off to Michael <laughs> Havlin. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, Michael Havlin, uh, Manager of Government Affairs for Cox Communications, and I will hand it over to Jack Cumming. Uh, I'm Jack Cumming. I'm an actuary having technical difficulties this morning, <laughs> but good, good morning, everybody. And uh, I wasn't here in the beginning, so I'm not sure. Has, has Tom Robertson been heard from? Yes, yes. I, I can pass it along for you. How about uh, Deb Beddow? Good morning, Deb Beddow from your ops manager. We help companies with less than 50 employees with all of their back office admin work, and I will pass it off to Captain Magana. Good morning, Captain Magana with WWM Financial. I work with business owners and corporate executives and help them with comprehensive financial and manage their money so they can live their lives. I'll pass it on to Rachel. Good morning, everyone. Rachel Ivanovich. I'm the president of Easy Life Management. I'm also a board member of the Carlsbad Chamber, and I'm pleased to be here this morning. Thank you. Thank you. And if you're not speaking, could you please mute? Because there's a little bit of an echo there. Uh, how about Chris Porter? Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Chris Porter. I'm with Cox Communication. I'm a senior account executive. And if anyone's having problem with their internet connections as it relates to Zoom or any of their other business needs, I'm here to help. Thank you. I'll pass it over to John Osborne. Hi, good morning, everyone. John Osborne, Director of External Affairs for AT&T. Uh, we provide wireless, landline, and entertainment communication services for all of our customers. And Teresa, I'll let you pass it on to whoever's next. Okay, how about Matthew Fye? Matthew Fye with the Office of Senator Pat Bates, and I will pass along to Aaron Bizak. Hi, everybody. This is Aaron Bizak, Chief of External Affairs, Tri-City Medical Center. And I can't see okay. anybody else, so you guys can handle the passing on. That's okay. How about Katie Scanlon? Good morning, everyone. Katie Scanlon with San Diego Gas and Electric. Great. How about Christine Wright? Christine, you're on mute if you're speaking. I, you don't have video, so I can't tell. Okay. Um, how, how about we'll pass it along to Tracy Carmichael? You're on mute. Trace. There you go. There you go. Uh, hi, I'm Tracy Carmichael with the Carlsbad Christmas Bureau. And I'll pass it on to that Rosemary Eshelman. Rosemary's gone already. How about Terry Kaltenbach? Hi, uh, this is Terry Kaltenbach with KBA Associates. Uh, I can't see anybody else other than Brett, so I'll pass it on to whomever. <laughs> Thank you. It looks like we've got um, uh, our speakers are the only ones left that I can see. Is there anybody else who can wave your hand if you've not yet introduced yourself? I know we called on Christine and she couldn't, she, she wasn't able to uh, speak. Uh, how about Kathy Steffen and then Brett, of course. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Kathy Steffen with the Carlsbad Chamber of Commerce. And good morning, Brett Schonsenbach with the Carlsbad Chamber. Glad to have you guys along with us today. Great, thank you. I was just pulling up the agenda so I make sure that we're on track. Uh, we wanted to approve our meeting minutes from last month, from uh, September 2nd. I hope you've all gotten a chance to take a look at those. They were attached to our last uh, email that, that Brett sent out from the chamber that included our agenda for today. Um, we're happy to entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Thank mm -hmm. you, Terry. And do we have a second? 
I'll second. Teresa, I'll second. Wade. Okay, I'm trying to see who that is. Wade, okay, Wade's thank you. Place. Great, Terry and then Wade. Um, great, uh, let's call for the vote then. All in favor, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. <clears throat> it looks pretty good. Any objections? Okay, I don't hear anybody or see anything. Uh, so it looks like we're approving the minutes uh, unanimously. I have, oh, to, yes. I have to abstain. I wasn't at the meeting. Okay, so we'll approve the minutes uh, unanimously with the exception of those who were not in attendance and government officials and government agency representatives. Is that good? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Now we get to dig into our presentations today. Uh, as I mentioned at the top of the meeting, we have two excellent uh, topics uh, to go over today. The first one is voting, which I know is top of mind for everybody. And we have our San Diego County Registrar here. Uh, we've got Michael Vu. I, there he is. I was about to say his video wasn't on, but I know he has an excellent presentation and we've been seeing him make presentations to other groups around. So we've got him. We're able to secure a little time on his schedule to speak with us this morning. So thank you very much for being here today and the floor is yours. Thanks so much, uh, Teresa, and it's such a pleasure to uh, be speaking before my uh, Chamber of Commerce. I am a Carlsbad resident, many of you know that, and so it's really, uh, uh, I am so lucky to be able to join you this morning. Let me just say happy E-27, at least uh, that is the total number of days left bef uh, between now and election day. But as you can imagine, uh, uh, election the election has started already in earnest. And so I'm gonna go ahead and, and share my uh, presentation slide deck here and hopefully you can all see that uh, here in a second or two. Um, and let me just say that uh, just like this Zoom conversation, normally there's an invitation if, uh, if I was uh, asked to speak at the chamber that we would all be uh, heading and I would be at the Chamber of Commerce, but like everything else, we've been kind of upended and uh, this goes with how this election is gonna be conducted. Never did I fathom four years ago after the uh, last presidential general election that we would be conducting this election the way we are, but we are. And um, there's a level of, let me just say insanity in all of this, uh, something that generally takes four to six years to prepare for, we're doing in a short four to six month. And part of any success of an election is really gonna be the cooperation of every single one of our registered voters in our county. But I really wanna give you kind of the makeup of this upcoming election, kind of the decision-making, because I think the public deserves um, the ultimately how we came about conducting the elections the way we're going to um, do it. And as I'm going to describe, many of you probably already know what those are because you've already started receiving your mail ballot in your mailbox, and if you haven't, it's on its way. Um, so let me go ahead and go straight into this overall conversation of uh, this upcoming presidential general election and as it relates to conducting it under the cloud of a pandemic. Uh, for, for myself, we really have to start back in March, uh, during the March 3rd presidential primary election. And many of you know, during that election, we really were not impacted as a result of the pandemic itself. We had March 3rd, likely it was an early presidential primary election this year, as opposed to having it in June, we were conducting it in March based off the legislature's change as well as the governor's sign off to move it to March as opposed to, to normally in a June election timeframe. Uh, thank goodness we were able to have 1,548 precincts uh, and the 7,000 poll workers during that time frame, over 7,000 poll workers to conduct that election. I remember coming to the Carlsbad Chamber of Commerce and presenting out on how that election was going to be conducted. And we were able to really conduct the elections. All the fundamentals were there, uh, including poll workers and polling locations for us to facilitate that election. But as many of you may remember is, is that shortly after that March election, the governor issued the executive order for everyone to shelter at home. And for us, we could not shelter at home. We were still in the midst of certifying the election. And after election day, after the March 3rd, we go into a 30 day certification period to uh, fine tune, to reconcile everything that occurred at the polling locations, all 1,548 precincts that we had out there, uh, count and verify all the remaining timely cast ballots in, in the election, including mail ballots, as well as provisional ballots any damage ballots that we had, but also uh, reconcile, when I talk about reconcile, effectively audit 
everything that we did for the election. So with that way we can move towards certifi certifying the election. But how do you do and conduct and certify an election when the governor issues an executive order and we are considered a critical infrastructure? We were given that designation after the 2016 presidential general election. Um, as a result of that election, the Department of Homeland Security designated elections as a critical infrastructure to, to the entire co country. Many of you I, uh, that I've heard uh, that is participating on this uh, meeting uh, and this presentation uh, are part of that critical infrastructure, other pieces of the critical infrastructure, things like the uh, power grid, uh, transportation corridors. Those are all part of the critical infrastructure. Well, now elections is part of that uh, umbrella uh, as it relates to the, the, to the federal government. So for our office, we were considered essential workers and we had to remain at the office. We could not shelter at home. We were all at the office. And how do you do that and, and, and balance that with the social distancing requirements when you grow from a staff of 65 individuals to now ballooning up to 1,200 seasonal staff members that we bring on board to our office to help finish up an election or to conduct an election? That's not including the 7,000 to 8,000 poll workers that we had to recruit that worked that one day on election day during the March 3rd election. So really what it came down to is, yes, the voters were not impacted, but at the office, if you looked at behind the curtain as we were trying to finish up the election, which all of you, the public has the ability to see, and is we are a very transparent office, uh, saw that we really had to extend ourselves and figure out how are we gonna process several hundreds of thousands of mail ballots as well as provisional ballots when we had to socially distance? And how do you pack, if you will, 1,200 individuals uh, in like sardines into a building that just really was not meant for social distancing? Well, we ended up being able to certify the election on time. We had to figure out how uh, to, which staff members we could send home to remote work. Um, and also those individuals that had to remain at the office to verify ballots. And, and we really had to uh, balance out between those two things. Luckily, we didn't have to uh, uh, use any of the extended time that the governor issued in terms of another executive order, extending the certification period, and we were able to certify the election on time. But during that time frame, that same time frame, shortly after the March uh, 3rd election, the governor, uh, the Secretary of State's office, the state legislature, really the state uh, Secretary of State as the chief election officer of the state formed a task force um, throughout the entire state, uh, including um, my colleagues, myself, uh, legislative representatives, governor representatives, advocacy groups that were a part of this task force to start thinking about the November election. What they recognized was that local elections officials, the other 57 counties, as well as myself, needed as much time to prepare for the election. The state legislature recognized that there were fundamental aspects of conducting the election uh, that needed to, to be looked at. Uh, and that's part of where this presentation kind of starts, is, is what are those fundamentals and how did we drive to those decision-making where everyone is receiving a mail ballot. So let me go ahead and get in straight into the next um, slide deck here. Let me just kind of briefly kind of talk with you about the life cycle of a, each election. And there is a characteristic of each election. You have probably maybe heard me say this before, but every election has a unique set of characteristics and no two elections are the same, regardless of whether or not it happens every four years, every two years, or whether there's a special election. Let me kind of give you a brief synopsis of what this election is looking like. We have over 1.9 million registered voters on the books uh, currently. This uh, is over two, uh, over a quarter million more registered voters than we had in, during the November 2016 election. And we have not yet hit the voter registration deadline, which is October 19th. Um, you may have already received your local sample ballot and voter information pamphlet, but we're gonna be mailing over 2 million of those. Now you may be asking yourself, well, why are we mailing 2 million sample ballot pamphlets when you have 1.9 million registered voters? The reason why is because we are federally covered for five, four additional languages other than the English based off of the Voting Rights Act. We have to support Spanish, Filipino, Vietnamese, and Chinese in our community based off of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So anything that we do in English, we have to translate into those respective protected languages 
um, that is out there. So the ballot and all the local sample ballot pamphlets as well. So some individuals get two sample ballot pamphlets, one in English as well as in one in the respective language that uh, we have identified. Now you may ask yourself in this upcoming election, how many seasonal staff members, how many uh, staff do, will we bring on? Well, as I mentioned before, we were anticipating bringing around 9,000 volunteer poll workers, plus the additional 1,200 individuals, plus the 65 individuals that we have. And as you may have heard me say before, office really does balloon up quite a bit, and we always become one of the largest employers. I know SDG is up there in terms of the, one of the largest employers for the county, but our office becomes one of the largest employers in the county for one day. Um, and we go up to about 10,000 uh, individuals that participate and help us out during any given election. But in this election, around 4,500 individuals. Uh, and just to let you know, our poll workers are now part of that umbrella. No longer is it gonna be a volunteer position, but a paid hourly position. And I will explain that in, sh in a short bit. Military and overseas voters. Well, voters started receiving their ballots on Monday. I don't know if you've received yours. You can raise your hand if you, you did. Um, I know that my wife and my son did receive theirs uh, on Monday. I have not received mine. I didn't get a chance to check uh, this morning or yesterday for to see if my mail ballot has come, but it's in the mail, as they say, um, for every single registered voter in this county. But our military and overseas voters received theirs always 45 days in advance of election day, whether that's through mail or that's through email because of our Military and Overseas Voter Empowerment Act, which the federal government passed back in 2009, was effective in 2010. So over 14,000 mail ballots, as well as emailed ballots, were sent out back on September 18th and 19th of this past month. And we already have hundreds of ballots back from our military and overseas voters. Now you may ask yourself, how many languages do we support now in this upcoming election? Well, after the March election, we had seven covered languages, uh, the five that I talked with you before, and then there's what is known as the state cover California Voting Rights Act, which we were covered for two, and then between the two elections, between March and now, we have two additional languages. So what are the state covered languages? Not as onerous, not as comprehensive that we have to provide uh, in terms of the federally covered languages that I spoke about, uh, but they're still covered languages that we have to provide some services to. Uh, what are those languages? That's Laotian, that's Japanese, that's Korean, and that's Arabic. And those are in specific precincts throughout the entire county, not throughout the entire county like the other federally covered languages that I spoke about. Now, uh, let's talk about the total number of contests that is on the ballot. We're gonna have 196 contests that, that are on the ballot across the entire county. Uh, when you think about the 196 contests and you place all the respective contests and their boundary lines on top of one another, it's gonna create 842 types of the ballot, okay? 842 types of the ballot. You all get one of those ballots, but know that there is 841 other types of the ballot that is circulating out there that voters are receiving based off of the contests that they're eligible to vote on. That's a pretty complex when you think about 2016. In 2016, we had 623 ballot types in that election. Now you may ask yourself, well, why such an increase between 623 and now 842 versions of the ballot? That's because the, all the changes that are happening within the cities, moving from at large to district forms of government, creating of city council districts, as opposed to voting your city council members at large, all the school districts that are changing to at large to now trustee areas, all the healthcare districts that are doing the exact same thing, like Tri-City, I believe is, is one of those that recently has done so. All of that is now coming to roost in this election from 2016 to 2018. We now over manage over 430 different political districts in terms of their respective boundary lines. And that's what's creating all these different variations to, to the tune of 35% more ballot types than we had back in 2016. So when you think about the 842 and the five federally covered languages that we support, really you have to multiply those two numbers together to get the total number of variations of the ballot that is out there. So we manage our, in this election, 4,210 variations of the ballot in this upcoming elections. So uh, when you think about the, the size, the breadth and size and the complexity of our county in terms of conducting the election, know that 
there are multiple parallels of, uh, of how this election is going to be conducted than just a simple, you know, you getting your ballot um, and uh, what is happening with the rest of the, the county itself. Well, not just in size in terms of registered voters, but breadth and complexity in terms of how this election has to be put all together in a very short window of time. Generally, we only have around 88 days to put all of this together, including the local sample ballot and voter information pamphlet and your ballot because of the, uh, the candidate filing deadline, which occurs always 88 days before the election. Turnout. Let's talk about that. Generally, you don't get into the prediction at, right at, at this early in the hunt about what the election is going to turn out is going to be. But if, as I look at the data, uh, the last four presidential general elections, we had a 79.5% turnout. So the, I anticipate a big turnout in this upcoming election. The largest turnout was 84% turnout in 2008. Last presidential general election was an 81.5% turnout. So uh, I anticipate anywhere from 1.5 to 1.6% million people could potentially be a million voters uh, going out and voting in this upcoming election if we have an 80% turnout. And that might be conservative. So, you know, I've talked to really uh, about the legislature, the governor, and this task force that was uh, put together. Ultimately, there, there was banding around for weeks, multiple meetings a day on sessions like this throughout the entire day. Let me just say my back hurt after every single day just based off of all the conversations that were happening. A lot of debates happening in turn between advocacy groups and uh, local election officials and state legislature about how this was going to be conducted. How could we even conduct an election in a world of a pandemic? Ultimately, uh, let me just say that I really appreciated the state in two fashions. One, decisive decisions were made, regardless of whether or not you agreed or didn't agree about where we were going. And two, that they were quick because again, elections officials, local election officials, who's on the ground needed every single moment of the day to then pivot and cut over to, to ultimately how we we're conducting the election as, as, as we progress in the short 27 days that we have left. So once the governor issued the first executive order about everyone receiving a mail ballot, that was an active registered voter. Uh, that was his first one in May, early May. The second one in early June was in-person voting, polling place voting. Would there be any? That was kind of the debate that was going on. And the answer to that question was, yes, the governor and the state recognized that there was going to be situations where individuals still want a polling place uh, environment or need a polling place to vote at. Uh, simply just going by mail was not going to be sufficient. But once those policy decisions were made, we ended up having to really get into the nuts and bolts and details of an election. And let me just say that there are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of moving parts during any given election. And one of those moving parts is the 1.9 million registered voters that we have out there as to how everyone needs to have accessibility and be able to cast a ballot in private, um, in a, now a healthy and safe way, but also uh, meeting your expectations about how do we do this with the utmost integrity, accuracy, transparency, and security around that. Um, and also, as part of this cutover of all these two significant changes uh, that the governor uh, office uh, uh, issued, the governor issued in his executive order, was informing voters. So these two pieces are uh, effectively our goals in this upcoming election. And they are, have to be coming hand in hand if we're going to run this election uh, successfully. And every single voter's cooperation and informed and educated and being prepared is so important. Um, so we do not surprise any given voter uh, that we have here in, in our county. And, and that uh, tells you this logo here, Vote Safer San Diego, encapsulate how this election is going to be conducted and what we really did need to do. And for us, we really didn't need to wrap our arms and huddle together for a couple of more weeks as uh, these were moving targets when we were talking about from task force level, and then ultimately my, moving towards the decision-making about how we were gonna be able to conduct this election, how poll worker training was going to get, how poll uh, worker recruitment was going to be handled. All of that has changed. The whole organization has flipped on its head, similar to to all of you who own businesses, you've had to manage differently. And this is how we've had to manage uh, the ability to conduct the elections and how we've had to now launch into the biggest and most robust and comprehensive public education and voter outreach effort that we've ever done. Okay, what are the two fundamentals in terms of any conducting any 
in any election. Well, there are poll workers and polling locations. And as you can see here is that these two fundamental aspects is the, also what's being impacted uh, our, of our ability, of any elections official's ability to conduct an election, not just in our county, in our state, but across the entire country, is how do you conduct uh, uh, get enough poll workers that the majority of poll workers or a high percentage of poll workers are in also in this high risk category because they belong in the 65 plus age group and they're at high risk of potentially contracting the virus and having uh, bad outcomes there. How do you recruit enough polling locations when many of them are private locations and now these locations are way too small to faci facilitate social distancing? How do you do that when the locations themselves, the poll owners, are trying to run a business and now uh, they cannot really uh, do uh, accept liability in terms of us having uh, poll workers as well as now voters showing up in huge amounts during a presidential election to be able to do that. Those were two dynamics, create a level of uncertainty. And if there are any of you that are event-driven organizations, you know you need to build to certainty. You need to know that every piece of the puzzle is going to come together at the right time and that they're secure for you to be able to conduct your business successfully. Same thing with elections. So let me give you a data perspective associated with that, how that impacts us as we ana analyze it. As you can see here, 30% of our poll worker population that served in the March election was in this high risk 65 plus age group. And, but you can't really just stop there because if you look at the other spectrum, you see that our 19-year-olds represent 20%. And what are they doing right now? They're distance learning. And so if you think about the fundamentals of elections and you need poll workers, how could we ever conduct a neighborhood polling place election in the world of a pandemic when 50% of your population uh, that works for you, that volunteers for you, is now in question? You don't. You wouldn't be able to get off of first base. You wouldn't be able to launch if there, that was the case. Polling locations. As we looked at the total number of polling locations, physical sites that served during the March election, 69% of all voters reported to a private location. What did we learn for those in those jurisdictions across the entire country? Remember, we were lucky. We didn't have to conduct an election during the cloud of a pandemic. What we had to do, though, what we saw, though, is, is the experiences of other elections officials throughout the entire country that had to conduct their presidential primary under the cloud of a pandemic. What did they experience? Well, they experienced locations that said, no, you can't use our location, even though they have historically used locations as a polling locations business, as a, as a polling location. And the pull, rug being pulled underneath, creating confusion for voters that were out there. And for us, as administrators, we felt really bad for those election administrators across the entire country that had those situations, because now they're in a mad scramble. Uh, again, you can't live to that where one day you have a location and the next day, because you inform the public, and the next day saying that they, you can't use it. That's just not a way you conduct any given election when it's the largest election you're going to conduct and largest event that's going to really happen in any uh, sort of the imagination in our country, and frankly, around probably the globe. So for us, we had to build to confidence of availability and use and public facilities was where we eyed and targeted um, our strategies around this. And because of social distancing, we no longer could use that neighborhood garage or pizza parlor uh, that was too small. Instead, something much larger, multi-purpose rooms, recreation centers, community centers, gymnasiums, um, locations that have sufficient parking, uh, locations that were strategically known. Uh, but not just that, but balance that with our geography, which is very diverse that is out there. And then also tackling accessibility, and not just accessibility in the terms of, of voters with disabilities, but all the other forms of accessibilities, transportation corridor, corridors, population density, socioeconomic status, um, the fact of urban and rural, as we talked about the geography again. Um, all of that had to be factored in as we made our decisions at going back. And then the lastly, we had to take in consideration the election makeup itself which is those 842 ballot types because everyone has a set and voters still need to be assigned any one of the super polls locations that we were gonna assign them should they go out and vote um, at a polling location. So let me kind of just kind of get to the quick on this. Uh, you can see what the, in purple, what the state law provided us in terms of options as well as what were required. 
March elections, kind of see what that makeup looks like, and then November. So let me get to the heart of November's election. Again, there was already an executive order that made it easy for us, which is every single voter is going to receive a mail ballot in this coming election. If we weren't going to resend a, everyone a mail ballot, you can already see that our county, our electorate, already votes by mail in high numbers. In fact, that 74% in March is now 78% in, in November. We're at 78% of our electorate already are signed up to be a permanent mail ballot voter and are used to voting by mail. So any of this conversation happening nationally of, uh, about whether or about not elections officials are, have the capacity, the U.S. Postal Service has the capacity uh, to manage a mail ballot election where every single voter is going to receive a ballot, that really does not ring true here in San Diego County because we are used to that. In fact, our infrastructure can meet that 100% capacity and has always been able to meet the, the capacity of the preferences of our voters that's out there. And we have been building to 100% capacity um, over multiple years than just you know, this upcoming election. So please don't let the national conversation dissuade what's really happening and what your general voter behavior is in our county because we will be prepared for you in whatever form or fashion you decide to vote. What are we doing with polling locations? As you can see, 1548 will now turn to 235. Most of those are now not just at private locations, but generally public facilities. We have a couple of private locations that we're going to use because of, uh, of strategically placed locations to serve voters. But by far, all of our locations, uh, for the most part, are public facilities, schools, county buildings, city buildings, state buildings that are out there. Um, also, as a running for one day on election day in a neighborhood polling locations, we'll be now running for a four day period. All of those 235 super polls locations, which a voter is assigned to one of those 235, it will be open starting on October 31st through uh, November 3rd at 8 p.m. Effectively, it's trying to respond to this pandemic. We want if they're gonna vote at a polling location to distribute themselves across a four day period across those 235 locations, so that there's not any congregation of crowding of voters at any given location. That's the reason why we have said voters are still assigned to a polling location, it's to avoid one location to get overcrowding and another location having no crowds whatsoever. So voters still are assigned to one of the 235 across a four day period. If you're gonna vote in person, do so early is what I would uh, uh, ask and have been recommending to the public to do so. But my Number one, encourage voting that mail ballot and getting it back to us through the U.S. Postal Service. Um, I know that there's been conversations about the U.S. Postal Service, but know that the mail ballot that you've received will have a postage paid return envelope. You know where your closest U.S. Postal Service collection box is out there. And the U.S. Postal Service has thousands of collection boxes as opposed to the infrastructure that we have. The, uh, regarding our mail ballot drop off locations, which as you can see here, we will have 126 which is double the amount of locations that we, that we had in uh, March. And we will be running them four times as long, as opposed to seven days, we will have it running for a 29 day window. And then those poll workers, as I mentioned, um, if there's one thing with this pandemic, uh, we are needing more and more staff members. Uh, we have brought on now uh, anywhere from 3,500 to 3,600 poll workers who will be paid an hourly wage, anywhere from $14.25 to $18 per hour. Um, and uh, poll workers are not, really not volunteering themselves for one day, but the commitment is really upwards of a nine-day commitment. Nine days because of the four days that they will be open, two days worth of training as opposed to two hours of training, which is what the old model was during the March election and the fact that we have to set up the site and break down the site the day before and the day after election day or the day before we go live on October 31st. Plus one day to receive um, all the equipment at the respective location. If you go to our county campus right now, it just started happening yesterday, you would see this huge stack of us staging the entire campus of all of the equipment that needs to get out to all of the respective polling locations. It pre looks pretty awesome in terms of all these pods being stacked up one another as we're staging them three high. They're almost as big as an entire building. Um, and there's 235 of these uh, massive uh, amounts of drayage that we have to logistically uh, manage to. Uh, and then again, the campaign, as I mentioned, is the most robust and you'll get to see that here in a second or two. 
I'm not gonna go into any respective details in terms of our capacity. I've already tried to convey what they are. I'm not gonna go through, through all these different points, but please know the last point on this slide here, which is if a mail ballot is postmarked, it has to be postmarked by election day and received now 17 days after election day, this is a new law based off of assembly bill 8, of 860, that ballot is now timely cast. But the operative term here is, is it has to be postmarked by election day and received within 17 days after the election day for it to be timely passed. Okay. In person, gonna be different. Let me just say that we're expanding our technology when it comes down to uh, what, will we, what we will introduce at the polling location, as opposed to having one check-in, we will now have seven check-ins. Besides signing into a paper roster to receive your ballot, you'll be signing into an electronic uh, poll book, which is effectively an iPad that has every single uh, registered voter, uh, active registered voter, act, not just just active, but every registered voter in, in San Diego County on the uh, uh, iPad. We will also know every voter's disposition and status of their mail ballot. So this notion that a person should vote their mail ballot and go to a polling location to vote, we will know whether or not we have a potential situation of a double voting because the electronic poll books will tell us the status of that mail ballot. We'll know if we've accepted and if a mail ballot has been returned back to our office. And if a person shows up um, that has already returned their mail ballot, the only way that they're gonna be able to vote is through a provisional ballot, which is a ballot that goes inside, goes inside an envelope and gets returned to our office for verification, okay? Um, and there's gonna be an expanded number of poll workers as opposed to four, we'll have 15 on average, and we will have upwards of 24 voting booths and ballot marking devices, which is the new touchscreen voting system that we have introduced in the March election um, to serve voters that are out there. Um, we know voters are wanting to go to a polling location. They either desire to go to a location or they need to get to a location. But let me get to the heart of those, those populations. If you desire and want, because it's democracy, this is how elections are conducted, totally fine, perfectly fine. We have set up the total number of polling locations and you're assigned one of those respective locations. But there are other populations, those that didn't receive their mail ballot and it's too late to send it through the uh, US Postal Service. Those that uh, have their mail ballot, but made a mistake and need a replacement mail ballot. Those individuals that are voters with disabilities. And then also those now that miss the registration deadline, still want to participate and want to now exercise conditional voter registration, which is the act of registering and voting same day at their assigned polling location or at the register of voters office after the October 19th deadline. Okay, so really quickly, I'm gonna go through this. This is really what, to, what traditional voting looks, precincts looks like. Uh, this is what we need to manage generally. This is, uh, I think the March 2016 election in terms of the total number of precincts that we had throughout the entire county. We had to move towards consolidating that. And that's what this looks like based off those ballot types that I talked with you about. And then after doing that, we could then cite the respective location as you, what you see here throughout the entire county where we have now 235. Let me just say, 235, but we wanted just to meet the minimum number of locations, we would only have needed 185. Our decision was not based off of the legislative policies and the governor's minimum threshold, which was one for every 10,000. Ours was based off of data. How many people do we think and anticipate will show up at a polling location based off of histor historical data from us and what this upcoming election would look like? So we added 28% more locations than what the minimum is based off of the law. Okay, all of you should have received uh, this mailer back in August, informing you effectively what I'm describing today. The fact that every voter is gonna receive a mail ballot. Uh, the fact that there will be fewer locations, but they will be running four times, four days as opposed to one day uh, to vote your mail ballot safely. Okay, and then also, people should start have received their uh, sample ballot and voter information pamphlet. And this is what it looks like. And on the back of this pamphlet will be your assigned polling location should you want to choose to vote at the polling location as opposed to the mail ballot. And note that because it has most likely changed. Remember, we're going from 1600 precincts is what we anticipated down to 235 physical sites. Okay. And then mail ballots should have started to arrive and what's inside of it is something new. Everything to the side here is what we call the wrap. Everything, why you're receiving the mail ballot if you're generally not a vote by mail voter, why you're receiving it. 
the fact that there are trusted sources, our mail ballot drop applications, and you can see the three closest one to where your residence address is, um, is, is what we've provided for, for voters that are out there that is um, customized to, to where you live. And the, of course, your ballot as well. Um, let me just go back to this really quickly, as well as you have the ability to track your ballot. You have the ability to now sign up and get notification, push notifications, kind of like uh, uh, tracking your parcels through FedEx or UPS. Um, and now you can track your mail ballot by subscribing to Where's My Ballot, and you can find that at sgvote.com. And at last known, I, there was about 130,000 San Diegans that had signed up for that. It's free of charge. Go to our website. And once you provide us your email or your cell phone, you'll get push notifications. And this is a state provided service that is out there. But let me get to the trusted sources for us because there's this conversation about ballot harvesting out there. And I always say that ballot harvesting is this kind of the harvesting side of it is kind of this pejorative term. Uh, I just call it frankly, as you can imagine, me being a very neutral and nonpartisan person is uh, really it's collecting a ballot and returning a ballot. And the harvesting side, uh, makes it sound like there's something nefarious that's going on. Can a person collect a ballot on behalf of another, another voter and return it back to our office? Yes, they can do so, so long as they do it timely. And of course, they're not gonna do anything that will compromise the voters will and intent of return that ballot. But voters have the ability to take it within their hands about good practices. Clearly marking the ballot with a blue or ink pen, signing the back of the envelope, sealing the ballot inside the envelope, and then returning it to a trusted source. And who are the trusted sources for the Registrar of Voters Office? That's the US Postal Service and the thousands of collection boxes that are out there. The mail ballot drop applications, which there are 126, started yesterday and will run through till November 3rd. And then the 235 locations, uh, super polls locations starting on October 31st. As I mentioned to you again, is, is for us, my recommendation is voting your mail ballot and returning it back sooner than waiting till election day to drop it off at any one of the Super Polls locations. We will also be doing another mailer in between now and election day for those voters that have not returned their mail ballot. And this is what it's going to look like, reminding them of where their um, Super Polls location is and returning that mail ballot. Okay, let me go into the heart of our our voter education outreach campaign. It's been a series of storylines and narratives of, as, as we try to increment through the life cycle of this election. Be ready to vote. Uh, make sure you check your registration. Make sure you register to vote in advance. Um, make sure you know that October 5th is when you will start receiving your mail ballot. How do you vote your mail ballot? Um, what are the good practices in, of voting that mail ballot and returning it back to our office? Um, and then also engaging our students, high school students, because they are pretty much effectively sitting this one out uh, in this election, but engaging them of creating some of the ads uh, that you see here, particularly the last set that I had showed you. Everything that we do in English, as I mentioned, is done in all the respective languages, whether it's news releases or other types of um, uh, ads that we provide out there into our community. I've already talked with you about where's my ballot but informed delivery, the US Postal Service has an informed delivery service too, where you can get a scanned image of every single piece of mail that's gonna show up in your mailbox. It's pretty uh, pretty nifty. I'm signed up and uh, that's how I know when my mail ballot's gonna show up in my mailbox. I'm not gonna go through the respective dates for you, uh, but ultimately, again, we only have 27 days, but October 31st through November 3rd is when those Super Bowls locations will be open, four days as opposed to just one day. Uh, and then lastly, and I know it probably went over a little bit, Brett, uh, but I think all of this was very important and is for you to communicate the success of this election is only going to land on everyone's cooperation and uh, being informed. And so for all of you, you own respective businesses um, and belong to other organizations, we ask that you pass on this information that I've described to you today uh, to your friends and families and your neighbors as well as all those respective organizations. Uh, let me just also say that there is a lot of information, whether it's misinformation or disinformation that is out there, um, or information that is circulating in other parts of the country that is not necessarily true here in our county. And I would ask that you really, if there is any questions associated with it, to become informed and go to our website at sdbo.com. There is information on there that we uh, provide that we tackle the questions about security and and, and uh, voter fraud and, and how we 
prevent that from occurring and our position on, on that topic, as well as how we manage things like the voter registration rolls. Uh, and I'm more than happy to answer those questions here too. So I'll turn the time back over to Teresa and I apologize if I have gone over my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. What an excellent presentation. So much information. I can see that uh, it was hard for you to rush through it because there's so much to share. Uh, would you mind taking the slide down so we could see people's faces? And that way I can call on people with their hands raised for questions. Thank you again. Uh, I know that Brett had a question. Go ahead. Yeah, Michael, thank you so much. Um, I'm always amazed at the complexity of your work and what is entailed <clears throat> to pull an election off. Two quick questions. Um, one, this came from a community member, but I've also experienced it myself. And that is they received uh, mail ballots for previous residents who used to live at their address that don't live there anymore. And then at my house, I received a mail ballot for one of my sons who's now moved out of state. So how do you ensure that those folks, you know, people don't just fill out those ballots and submit them uh, on behalf of people who they are not. And then the second question is um, on how quick um, mail ballots get processed. Do, as people are voting this month, do you start tallying those results so on election night, you can already have kind of a head start on results? Because obviously, besides the presidential election, there's a lot of local elections that people are very anxious to know the results of, like at city council levels or at uh, you know hospital levels, whatever. And uh, so when do you start processing mail-in ballots as you receive them? Uh, uh, thanks, Brett. So uh, just really quickly on the first question is, uh, yes, people uh, do move and we're only as good as the information that we receive back from voters or other government bodies about uh, maintaining the voter registration files. And we do use things like national change of address information, information that is supplied by us by Bureau of Vital Records uh, for death records or uh, the national change of address through the U.S. Postal Service um, and for, for voters as well um, and other political uh, election jurisdictions throughout the entire country, but it's not a perfect system because it's a dynamic roles um, and people do receive a mail ballot that may have potentially no longer live there. Uh, we ask individuals that would inquire about it is, of course, um, to strike that out and it's uh, right return back to center, which is back to our office. And what we do is, is <clears throat> then put that person on inactive status. But how we uh, safeguard that is every single mail ballot. I think there is kind of a myth out there that we only do a sampling of uh, signature verification of mail ballots. The answer to that is, is simply no. We actually verify every single mail ballot of the signature on the back of that envelope against the signature on file. And we track every mail ballot that we issue. Uh, any notion that we, you can just send millions of mail ballots out there and they're just gonna get into the hands of voters and we wouldn't know about it, uh, know that um, that's just not the case. We have the ability to, if you call, to suspend a mail ballot and reissue a, bell, a mail ballot too, or just, frankly, just suspend a, a, a mail ballot um, because we know who we've issued a mail ballot because it's all being tracked on the back end. And when we do suspend a mail ballot, it, it gets stopped right into its track once it comes back to uh, our office where we have two sorters that runs 44,000 envelopes, has, of course, software and technology behind it too flag which ones are suspended and which ones are challenged and which ones are good uh, that are out there. Um, and then that signature of verification, every single one of the uh, envelopes are signature checked against the signature on file. So if we see anything that does not match, uh, we will not, uh, we'll flag it and then we will escalate it. And then ultimately, um, should it run through all the various escalations that we have on our side, um, if we end up challenging it, the voter, we correspond to the voter um, that we were not able to count their ballot because it's being challenged for a, not a, a signature miscompare and they have the ability to, uh, to cure it um, should they uh, need to be able to do that. Um, and, and then the other portion of this also is, I have to say, is um, the turnout. Uh, simply, when you have uh, an 84% turnout or 80% turnout, if there's any level of systemic fraud that's going to be happening out there, uh, you would, our office would be hearing about it. And simply, I just do not hear it uh, about it in any uh, major sense uh, during the life of an election. Uh, I, I always work with our closely with the district attorney's office as well as the FBI. I always get every two years, I get a call from our, our local uh, FBI agent. Her and I have established a relationship, but they are monitoring. I just had to refer a matter um, uh, related to a person wanting to give a discount for, for if, they, if individuals vote for a specific candidate 
um, and had to refer that matter to the district attorney's office who then referred it to the FBI. And, um, and I try to reach out to that location, um, but just know that it won't be tolerated. And if we find out, we will refer it to the proper law enforcement uh, body. And besides the DA or the FBI um, is also the Secretary of State Fraud Investigation Unit, but generally we handle it locally here first. Um, the second portion of your question is we now have the ability to process mail ballots as soon as we receive it back. Uh, we've always had the ability to verify signatures off of an envelope as, as soon as we receive it, but we had to hold off on scan, uh, extracting the ballot out after it's been verified and scanning it into our tabulation system until the 14th day. Well, the legislature changed that has, and now allows us to do it as soon as we receive it back. So those local contests, um, as soon as we receive a mail ballot, we have the ability to get it into the count but we cannot release those results until shortly after the polls close at 8 p.m. Uh, because voting is still occurring. Thank you so much. We don't have a lot of time, maybe two more questions. I see one in the chat from John Osborne. Do you wanna ask a question? Oh yeah, my question was, can your ballot be mailed from another city or out of state? Uh, if you take your ballot with you, you're gonna be on vacation or you know, what have you, can that be mailed back uh, from another location? Uh, simple answer is yes, John. Perfect, thank you. It's all postage paid too. Uh, uh, just really quick, I think there was kind of a myth out that's out there. So I, I heard someone say, hey, if you put a first class stamp on that a prepaid postage envelope, it'll get uh, classified as first class and so therefore it'll get back to our office sooner. The answer to that uh, uh, issue is that is a uh, fiction. Uh, these prepaid postage envelope is already treated as um, first class. So all you'd be doing is wasting your money. Great. Thank you. And I see a second question from Judy Reese. She asked, are the drop boxes collected each day and by whom? So uh, it's uh, collected. Uh, there's a, a series of rotations, uh, not every single day, but there is a series of rotations throughout the entire week. So every uh, location, there's a pickup that's happening every single day, just in a specific set of schedule that's going on. And it's by our staff and it's a always two person rule that is out there, okay? And every single locations that we are using, we have already um, uh, worked with those respective locations to uh, ensure uh, ult ultimately we have our own chain of custody, our own tamper evidence seals and locks that we have, but also have worked with the respective uh, of locations uh, to ha secure the uh, the ballots themselves at any one of the uh, different locations. I know is is did we end up using the chamber Carlsbad chamber as one of our mail ballot drop off locations? No, there was another one that was already going to be used that was too close to us, so we we did not yeah. end up being. I know that we're using a number of uh, chamber of commerces that are out there, but I, I know that because I I knew I saw the list. I said I did have to say that we were we needed to spread them out a little bit further, Brad. But we really did want to use uh, the Chamber of Commerce. I apologize for for that. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for coming to our Chamber of Commerce meeting and sharing all of this very important information. For those of you who have asked about whether this presentation will be available, yes, this is being recorded. You can see at the top left. It's being recorded now, and we will post this on the Carlsbad Chamber of Commerce website so more people can see it who weren't here today. Thank you again, Michael, for being here with us today. I know you're busy. We'll let you go, uh, and we'll, we'll move on to our next speaker. Thanks. Uh, our next thank speaker you so much. is. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, our, <clears throat> Our next speaker is Sandy Curl. She is uh, the new lead of the San Diego County Water Authority, and we're so excited to have her with us uh, to share a brief overview of what she's working on at the San Diego County Water Authority. And Sandy, thank you for, for your patience. And uh, as you can see, we don't have a ton of time. We still have a lot of things on the agenda, but we're, we're glad that you're here with us. Thank you. Your turn. <laughs> Sandy, I, I don't see you, but um, I can't hear you. So you may be on mute. Oh, there you are. I see your, your screen. There you there go. There we go. Is that, uh, am I? You're good, there we, we go. can hear you. Okay, super. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I will move fairly quickly um, through the presentation. Um, as uh, was said, I'm the general manager of the San Diego County Water Authority. And I want to thank Brett and the chamber and the team for all you do to support the businesses um, 
and I um, really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I was appointed as the general manager in November of 2019, which seems like many moons ago, although it's not been that long. It's been an eventful um, uh, time period. Um, I've been with the Water Authority for over a decade, and prior to that, I was a city manager in the city of La Mesa. Um, so I have had significant experience with local development, uh, local issues, uh, economic development. And um, when I took over this role 10 months ago in the um, permanent position, I never imagined the challenges we'd be facing today with COVID-19. The good news out of all of that is that we as an organization have been able to uh, work with our member agencies, our board of directors, and be able to provide services nonstop 24-7, which is critical um, during this COVID crisis. Our 36-member board of director and 24-member agencies have all banded together to make sure the region is served with water. Um, today, I'm going to provide you just a brief refresher about our role in the region and then hit on three big issues at the Water Authority. If we could go to the next slide. Before I get started, um, I wanted to bring the board up to date on some important progress we've made in resolving litigation with uh, Metropolitan Water District. Um, looks like the slides are not up. Brett, you're on mute. Sandy, go ahead and keep talking. I'm, I'm fixing okay, it. Okay, great. Um, so I, since I have been appointed um, into this role, I've been doing everything possible to try and end our litigation with Metropolitan. Um, this is a very important issue. Uh, many of you have been with us and been supporters through this process. Um, and we thank you for that. Um, the one of the major costs that we pay or majority cost is to Metropolitan for our water. And in August, a Superior Court judge awarded the Water Authority 14.4 million in a final judgment in two cases that covered San Diego County ratepayers during calendar year 2011 through 14. Um, the judgment produced several other big benefits for this region, including um, significant increases in the region's uh, preferential rights to water at MWD, as well as um, ensuring that we are paying fair charges. Last February, the Water Authority Board of Directors voted to dismiss, dismiss several um, claims, which allowed us to move forward to get these, um, uh, to try and get settlement in some of the issues where we had initially received favorable um, uh, outcomes and as um, we continue into this year, we're looking to wind down the lawsuits. Um, and this uh, initial award is substantial and we hope to be um, wrapping up the litigation as soon as possible. Um, with that, I wanna move into the Water Authority. Just a quick refresher, we're the water wholesaler in San Diego County. We serve 3.3 million people and help to support the 245 billion dollar economy. <clears throat> we provide about 75% of the water used across the region. And um, we have a very collaborative approach and we are able to do what we do because of our 24 member agencies and our partnerships. Um, San Diego County has a lot of assets. Um, one of them, however, is not a lot of water. And so that's why we work diligently and strategically and collaboratively to diversify our water sources. Um, and as we went through the last two droughts, uh, that diversification served us very well. Um, with that, I'd like to share with you a quick video that we recently put together to tell our story. For 75 years, the San Diego County Water Authority and its partners have been securing and providing an affordable and reliable water supply for our region. We've grown to 24 member agencies. We've built the largest dam rays in the entire country. We've forged a landmark conservation program to ensure highly reliable supplies and created the nation's largest seawater desalination plant, all to ensure that we always have enough water, even in times of drought and economic uncertainty. 
We've accomplished all this by working together. We've provided a reliable and cost-efficient water supply for residents and businesses throughout the county by sticking together. And when the next water supply challenge hits California, you can be confident that the water will keep flowing because we keep getting stronger together. Great, so now that we've touched on the work that we've done uh, with regional coordination and long-term planning, I'd like to um, talk to you about three big ideas that we're working on. Um, during the recent heat wave, uh, many of you um, uh, had the um, benefit or the um, opportunity to be without power for a bit of time as there were um, strains on the grid. And um, we had rolling blackouts across California. It really highlighted an opportunity for the water industry um, to help address energy issues. Um, we can use water to generate power. And one of our most promising um, projects is a pumped energy storage solution at the San Vicente um, storage facility under consideration in partnership with the city of San Diego. Um, this project could store 4,000 megawatt hours per day for, of energy, 500 megawatts of capacity for eight hours. Had we have had this facility in operation during the last rolling blackouts, we would have had sufficient energy and storage to avoid those um, blackouts. Next slide. Uh, the project would create a smaller upper reservoir above the San Vicente Reservoir, along with the tunnel system and an underground powerhouse to connect the two reservoirs. Um, the powerhouse would contain um, pumps, uh, reverse um, pump turbines, the reservoirs near the terminus of the Sunrise Power Link, and it would allow the project to play a central role in integrating solar and wind energy from across the Southwest for use in San Diego. Um, and again, considering the current stresses on energy supplies, it's clearly time for really an innovative project like this, an investment. Many of you may know that we um, built the last um, uh, energy storage project that was built in the United States in the last 30 years at Lake Hodges, um, which has provided crit critical energy to the grid um, during um, not only songs um, going out of operation, but during the various energy challenges. So having a larger project underway would be very helpful. Uh, the second idea, next uh, slide, is we have a study that has been completed, a first phase to assess the long-term options for us to um, move our Colorado River water. Right now we transfer that through a uh, pipeline owned by MWD and those costs are going up substantially. So we're looking if we could build another pipeline out of Imperial uh, uh, to take our Colorado River, River water directly from there, reduce our cost and also provide opportunities to solve a variety of other uh, water challenging issues. Um, this is a generational project and it's important to study now because it will take decades to design, permit, and build. Um, our board will uh, review whether or not we'll move from phase A to phase B of this project in November um, and continue to um, look at this as a future project or if they'll stop that work. Um, but because we will be paying Metropolitan 12 to $18 billion between now and 2047 um, for uh, transferring this water, it's important that we take a look if there's a cheaper way to do that. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, two of our member agencies you may be familiar have, are looking at detaching from the Water Authority, uh, Rainbow and Fallbrook. This is really unprecedented. It's not happened anywhere in the state of California. Um, these agencies have been long-term members of the Water Authority and they have um, submitted applications to LAFCO um, which oversees these kinds of issues to look at attachment. Uh, the Water Authority Board adopted a resolution in May um, to say that if certain conditions were met, not met, uh, the Water Authority uh, would oppose um, the detachment. Our board has concerns about several critical issues, including loss of water reliability supplies to Fallbrook and Rainbow Ray Pair, which they have invested in since joining 
the authority in the 40s and the 50s and the financial impact to the remaining member agencies and potential conflicts with state water policy, which call for creating reliability within region. Next slide. We are part of a special committee at LAFCO formed to review these issues. It's by far one of the most complex issues that they have ever had to address, very different than uh, boundary changes um, that normally go through LAFCO. Uh, September 18th was the deadline to file comprehensive comments, which we have done. We want to continue to work with the Commission and LAFCO staff to make sure a very comprehensive process is conducted and all issues are addressed, including emergency response for fire protection, loss of property tax revenue, increased water rates for remaining water agencies, cost to leave the water authority, and overall uh, water reliability. So now, uh, next slide, having talked about the many challenges, there have been a lot of opportunities. Um, I actually was appointed acting general manager at the Water Authority in March of 2019. Um, and the first thing that I got to do was respond um, to COVID. Uh, within a week, we moved 75% of our staff out to um, remote work. Uh, we've engaged with the community during this pandemic to provide support. Um, our employees are essential uh, workers who continue to deliver the water, so they are employed. Many in our region are suffering. And our organization um, partnered with the San Diego Food Bank uh, to do a virtual fundraising and then bringing in all of the water agencies in San Diego to participate as well. We've continued vital work on capital improvement projects. Um, the uh, construction um, organizations have worked with us very diligently to ensure COVID safety and we've been able to continue to our vital projects preparing our major pipelines. Um, I'm very proud of our employees who have handled this with um, complete dedication and um, are in the norm of doing things differently as we all are. This now uh, virtual um, format for meetings seems to be normal. Uh, we have run our board meetings uh, virtually um, since uh, April, uh, which has been challenging but has worked. We have 36 board members um, so as you might imagine, it was a bit challenging. The picture in the upper left is former board chairman Jim McDaffer and myself in his office um, running the board meeting um, uh, with all of the board um, remotely accessing. We also have played a, played a critical role in um, Southern California providing um, distributions for uh, FEMA of masks um, to six counties. Um, delivering over 25,000 masks um, to ensure that folks are protected. Next slide. And one of the most important priorities I've had as the general manager has been implement measures to change our culture at the Water Authority, focusing on a variety of things, the morale, work environment, and really addressing the current societal issues of social justice and bias and ensuring that we as an organization are an employer of choice. Next slide. Despite these really dynamic situations um, and others at many different levels, I'm proud to say the Water Authority and its member agencies continue to deliver safe, reliable, and affordable water 24 seven. I'm also pleased to tell you that we have not had any incidences of COVID. Um, we have worked very hard to um, have safety protocols and segregate our staff to ensure that our critical operators um, are protected um, to ensure that we're able to deliver the water. Um, the, that um, has been really critical in addressing the COVID uh, crisis to ensure that there's a clean and reliable, safe water. Um, and we hope that at some point in the near future, we'll be moving into the recovery phases and we'll see people back into whatever the new normal is um, in terms of operations. Um, safe and reliable water supplies are often taken for granted, um, but there's been nothing easy about it. It requires continual upkeep of our 310 miles of large diameter pipeline, continual water quality testing, and continual coordination with our member agencies. But the thing that you can know is whether we're in the office or working from home, our mission is to make sure that you can always um, trust the tap. 
And a last issue that I wanted to touch on because um, I am talking uh, with you as North County agencies, um, you may have heard recently um, that we had litigation filed against the Water Authority by Palisados um, over their water deliveries. And uh, next slide. And I just wanted to take a moment to explain to you what the situation is. The Water Authority values um, Palisados highly as a long-term partner in providing a safe, reliable water supply for the region. Um, both Carlsbad and Wallet uh, Balacitos into, entered into a special arrangement with the Water Authority to be able to increase their reliability of their supplies. They have a contract for high quality treated water and specified that it could be from any source of the Water Authority's choice. These went into place after, um, at the same time that uh, the Carlsbad desalination project was developed. Um, Carlsbad and Balacitos um, pay a bit more for that guaranteed water supply. And what they get in return is that during a drought, those supplies cannot be reduced. That is their local supply as if they had created the water within their own agency. Um, because uh, the pipeline, uh, direct pipeline for Balacitos from uh, the desal pipeline was down for a period of time, uh, Valacitos felt that they should have been reimbursed for the higher cost of water. Um, the Water Authority disagrees with that. It's a contract dispute. We will work diligently and have worked diligently to try and resolve it. But at the end of the day, Valacitos got what they paid for, which is a guaranteed source of supply um, and a supply that could not be taken away uh, during a um, uh, drought period of time. So we're hopeful that we will get this resolved, um, but wanted to be upfront that that is a challenge that we're uh, working with right now. And then my last slide, I just would encourage you all to stay in touch with us. We have a Citizen Water Academy, uh, which is very popular. We're going into our first session of doing it virtually now, which will be very interesting. And unfortunately, we won't be able to take people uh, to the sites, but we'll be bringing the sites to them um, until we're back in some more normal operations. Um, we have a water news network, which keeps you up to date on all of the current water issues, which are on our website, and you can contact us through um, various um, uh, social media sources as well. So I want to thank you for your time today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you for such an excellent presentation. And I, I do highly recommend the Water Authority, uh, Water, uh, Citizens Water Academy. I found it to be really interesting. Of course, that was pre-COVID, probably four or five years ago with Jason Haber. He was in my class too from the city of Carlsbad. So we loved it. And I'm really grateful to the Water Authority for providing that kind of experience to learn about our water supply. Uh, I think we could just take two questions because we have so much more left on the agenda. Um, uh, we could take them now. Go ahead, Amber. Mm -hmm. You're still on mute. We can't hear you. I double muted myself. How about now? Okay. You're good. Um, Sandy, thank you so much for your presentation. I really appreciated that. I, I was hoping you could um, expand a little bit on the LAFCO piece. So what actually happens to the Water Authority if um, the, if LAFCO approves uh, the, the two um, removals? Those two agencies would get their go to Eastern Municipal Water District um, and to get their water, which means they would be getting their water directly from Metropolitan. They're not buying into the Eastern system, um, which means that um, they would pay a lower rate and that's what they're interested in. Um, that's their primary focus for doing this. And while we understand that, um, there are investments that have been made to ensure supply reliability, um, which have been made on behalf of all of these agencies. And so that's very challenging. And then secondly, state law says that you have to reduce your reliance on the Bay Delta. And by them getting water directly from Metropolitan, they're taking more water off of the Bay Delta versus the local supplies that we've developed here. So one of the things the Water Authority has done has implemented a permanent ag rate, which those two agencies have quite a bit of ag within their jurisdiction. 
Um, and um, so the actual difference between the rate that they pay and the rate they pay at Eastern is um, lower than it has been talked about. But again, their focus is just to pay less um, and they're not uh, concerned about reliability um, going forward. It's really a financial issue. It reminds me very much of the electric industry when deregulation happened and folks went out and shopped for prices and then we all know what happened with that. So it's, it's very challenging. Um, certainly understand their issues, but at the same time, um, there's been much regional planning and investment on behalf of all of the agencies um, that's important to recognize. Thank you. Great, thank you. We'll take one more question before we move along. Um, nope. I was gonna ask you about how you were adjusting to COVID, but you covered that so nicely. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't have that question. I don't see any other hands up. Okay. I think uh, we're ready to move on then. Thank you very much for Thank being here. Thank you all here. so much. Appreciate you. Yes, okay. I like the little clap hands for anybody who <laughs> doesn't know how to do that. It's in the reactions uh, on the bottom bar. There's a little reaction uh, with a happy face and a plus sign and you can do clap hands there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we're, we're ready to move along. I know there's a piece of business that keeps getting pushed uh, down the agenda, and that is Marsha Akers. Do we have, is Haley here? I didn't see her earlier. No, Haley was not able to join us today. <laughs> so are we pushing that off again till next time? <laughs> it's fine if we do. I just want to make sure we didn't forget about her because I know she wanted to talk about that project and it was on the agenda and we had to push it off the agenda because of time. We'll go ahead and, and run a yeah, go we'll go ahead and okay. push it off till next month when Haley can be here again. Great, thank you. I know we're trying to run a tight ship. We have such great speakers and we want to hear as much as we can from them, but I also want to respect your time and get you out. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to ask for the remaining speakers to please be brief, succinct in your comments so that we can get out of here uh, and we don't have people drop off right in the middle. So we'll go ahead and start with our legislative reports. Uh, and with the, the top of the ticket at the national level, uh, Kyle, will you report out on behalf of the Congressman? Yeah, good morning again. Um, I'll be brief, just three items. Kyle Crowfund with Congressman Mike Levin. Uh, Congressman Levin was in DC recently helping uh, pass a number of different bills. First was another round of stimulus for small businesses, local government, and everyday Americans. It's a smaller version of the HEROES Act. It's meant to be a compromise with the Senate and the White House. It has a second stimulus check. Uh, the federal unemployment benefit, state and local aid, which is really important for our local cities to be able to continue their services, um, as well as additional support for small businesses by improving the Paycheck Protection Program. So really hoping the Senate and the White House uh, come together and decide to come back to the table and negotiate. Also, on uh, September 24th, the House passed the Clean Ener Economy, Jobs, and Innovation Act. And that includes uh, several pieces of legislation that the Congressman introduced, actually. Some of it uh, helps get the waste off of San Onofre. Uh, more uh, sooner and more safely, and also an amendment to study wildfire smoke emissions um, so we can better prepare for the poor air quality uh, that results from those. And then finally, on September 23rd, the House passed the Deliver Act, which was the Congressman bill actually, and included six different uh, bipartisan bills uh, to strengthen and expand services for homeless and unemployed veterans. And I will wrap there because you can actually hear more from the Congressman um, because the Chambers are hosting a debate tonight uh, that's being recorded tonight, so tune into that. Great. What time is the debate and how do we watch it? Um, let me let me chime in on that. Um, the debate is tonight, but it's not uh, open to people attending it live. It's being recorded and then we're going to share it with everybody soon, you know, like tomorrow and going forward. Great. Thank you very much. Sorry, I wasn't up on that. So I just was hoping that we could get that info. Thank you very much. Uh, next in line, we've got our state senator's office, Pat Bates. Matthew, Matthew will you speak for her? Yes, thank you. Um, as I had mentioned at the last month's meeting, uh, one of the senator's pieces of legislation that was on the governor's desk uh, did get signed. That was SB 934. Uh, that was the legislation regarding uh, nonprofit filing fees. Um, so in a very kind of tough year um, and trying to get legislation through um, and that we had to pare down a lot, um, little small success there of getting something signed by the governor um, and something that will help out um, our nonprofits that do a lot of great work in the community um, and make sure that um, every dollar they have uh, can go even further now. 
Um, finally, I just will mention really quickly, uh, we had kind of an exciting training uh, this week from the EDD on a new system for our offices uh, that we can submit cases um, in a much easier, um, in my opinion, much better way. Um, unfortunately, it's on new cases, not so much the cases that we already have, which is quite a bit, um, but I think it will definitely help moving forward uh, for anybody that is seeking help from our offices on EDD cases. Um, it's a lot more streamlined. It's a lot better system. Um, so we're really excited um, that this can help provide a lot faster relief for a lot of people seeking uh, help from our offices. So um, please keep sending folks um, our way. Uh, we're still here to help and serve those people that are looking um, to get their unemployment benefits. Um, so please um, don't hesitate to reach out to our office. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Alex, will you report out on behalf of Assembly Member Bernard Horvath? Yes. Um, good morning, everyone. So I'll be brief. Um, one big highlight is Governor Newsom signed Assembly Member Tosh Bernabas Economic Recovery Bill, AB 1731, which uh, incentivizes businesses participation in the state's work share program and expands the number of workers covered under partial unemployment insurance. So this legislation aims to keep employees employed while um, not putting additional cost burdens on small businesses. And that was signed last week and had an urgency clause, so it went into effect immediately. We we're very happy to see this bill um, signed by the governor. It was sponsored by Cal Chamber and it was supported by the Carlsbad Chamber. Um, so very encouraging. And then additionally, our office is hosting a virtual Veterans and Military Service Awards in November, and we just opened our call for nominations. So if you know any active service members or veterans um, who live or work in 8076, um, please feel free to fill out our nomination form. I will go ahead and um, forward that on to Brett so everyone has that. And then just like Matthew, our office is very encouraged to see um, EDD's new system for entering cases and managing their cases it seems to be much more efficient and we're more hopeful um so we're still helping hundreds of constituents so if you know anyone who needs assistance accessing um, their unemployment benefits or help with the dmv we're getting a lot of dmv cases right now um please feel free to send me an email or give me a call thank you very much thank you very much and uh, next we've got our county level uh crystal will you be speaking for supervisor desmond Yes, good morning, everyone, and hello from Supervisor Desmond. Uh, a lot going on as usual. We have a board meeting coming up next week. Uh, at our last board meeting, uh, we had a lot of activity. The Board of Supervisors voted to support Proposition 20 and oppose Proposition 15, so those are kind of election-related items. Um, as you know, the state did their press conference Yesterday, we are still in the red tier for our COVID tier. Um, we seem to be pretty strong. We are hoping to move out of that tier into um, less restrictive ones. Um, we are trying to figure out the formula for the social equity. So there's a bunch of different formulas that go into your actual positivity rate. Um, we are extending testing into areas that are most affected by COVID, so more for focus down on the South Bay area, making sure that we are doing um, uh, increased testing of that area. And we find out once a week, typically on Tuesdays, um, how we are measuring up with the rest of the state and other counties on how many tests are being issued, because that goes into our number as well. So we're keeping a close eye on that. San Diego County is doing well, but in the meantime, um, it was mentioned yesterday at the press conference, there is no green tier, there is no plan. The governor is, has said he is not working on a plan for a free, full reopening of California. So that's causing us a little bit of concern. The supervisor has been working with supervisors from other counties, Orange County, Riverside County, um, and then moving up, up the state to open Cal now, which is a, um, a movement to make sure that we have a plan to reopen California safely. We're seeing an extraordinary number of businesses closing permanently. Um, that's a little concerning for us. So we're gonna continue working on that. I will put my contact information in the chat and also Brett knows how to get a hold of me. And then on my last note, the County of San Diego opened up their business uh, loan program to all of San Diego County, not just the unincorporated areas. And I think Brett, um, the chamber pushed that information out, but 
go ahead and contact me or Brett if you have questions about wanting to apply for a small business low interest rate loan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Crystal. It looks like Jason Haber had to drop off. I'm looking for him on the screen, but I don't see him anymore. He did. He had to leave at 8.30. He put a sizable update in the chat, so I would encourage people to take a look at that and maybe even um, save the chat to their local desktop. Great. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't see it yet, so I will save the chat. Thank you. Uh, so we can move along now to uh, our um, board member, Catherine Magana's report. Hey, uh, so last month we had Kristen from Miracosta give us a real thorough update on the propositions, which was great getting you gearing up to the elections coming up. Uh, we did get, make a recommendation for four of the positions to the board uh, for more, which were the Proposition 20 to support, Proposition 21 to oppose, Proposition 22 to support, Proposition 24 to oppose. Those were approved on the month prior we had make, made the recommendation to oppose Proposition 15. So that's been handled. Um, there were a couple of job killer bills that were on our radar. AB 3216, that was actually vetoed by the governor. But there was um, SB 1383 that was signed by the governor. And what that does is it requires small business owners with five employees to provide eligible employees with 12 weeks of mandatory family leave. Um, so what that means is they would have to hold the position open for up to three months. And it also looks like some of those, um, that leave can be taken in one to two hour increments. And so while the employer doesn't have to necessarily um, pay during that time, they do have to keep those positions open. So that's just some more um, timely and costly potential um, aspects of for business owners to consider. Uh, and this will come into January 1st of 2021. That's it. Thank you very much. I was just checking the chat and um, I didn't see the, the update from Jason Haber. Maybe it wasn't sent to everyone. Oh, maybe he accidentally just sent it to me. I will, um, I'll look at that. I'm, I'm taking the minutes for Haley, so I'm kind of doing double duty right now. I will look at that and um, I will definitely uh, copy it into the um, minutes, whatever Jason put in there, because I, I did see that he typed quite a bit. Um, and then I'll, I'll try to get these minutes out timely to everybody. Great, and actually you're up for your update on behalf of the chamber, our yes. events and things. Super briefly, I know we're a couple minutes over time. Um, as was already mentioned, we have been very active during this uh, election season um, regarding candidate forums. So we hosted a Carlsbad City Council candidate forum two weeks ago. Last week, we hosted a Tri-City Medical Center um, Health District candidate forum. And tonight we are hosting um, a California 49th uh, you know, House of Representatives District forum. So the previous two that we hosted were recorded and are available on our chamber website, carlsbad.org. You can just click on webinars and you'll find them or uh, the city council one is actually on our homepage listed. Um, it's also on our YouTube channel and our social media. The one tonight, as I already mentioned, is not open to the public to participate. Um, many of you have submitted questions already. Thank you so much. Last I heard we had well over 50 questions that had been submitted, which is great. Um, we're recording it. It's in conjunction with the Oceanside and Vista Chambers, and we will make that available um, promptly so that folks who would like to, you know, get to know the two candidates can do that. So uh, watch your emails for information about the posting of those videos. And um, I think that's enough for me. I'll be quiet. Thank you. As you said, we're a few minutes over and we're so grateful to you for staying, for hanging in there to the last few moments. So we're going to go ahead and adjourn the meeting at 9.04. Thank you. Have a great day. Vote early and take care. Wear your mask. We'll see you later. <laughs>